Matt, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure. You're in the movie Touch. In your own words, describe the film for us. My own words, I'd say it's a, it's a, um, it's a psychological thriller road movie, mm. if I was to kind of um, place it into a, into a genre, um, uh, with um, art house sensibilities, I'd say. What do you mean by art house sensibilities? I mean that it kind of breaks a few conventions, it breaks a few rules, and it kind of steps outside of genre. Um, and I think there's also, um, you expect with, with, if someone describes a film as being art house, that it's you know, a little challenging. And, um, and, uh, also, um, you know, it's, uh, well, you know, it's a little arty. <laughs> <laughs> what are the qualities in a project like this that make you want to do the film? Um, well, the script, it's really always about, you know, it's always about the script, about the writing. Um, that's all you really have to work with. That's all you have to work with when you're, when you're approaching any, any, uh, work, um, and I read this in one go, which is unusual. Yeah. Often you, 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 you know, you find a, a screenplay and you, you just want to, you know, get to the end so you can do something else. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but this was, I, I read this in one sitting and I, and you know, from about page 10 in, I, I knew that it was something I wanted to be involved in because I just wanted to know what was, you know, what was going on and going on, what was going to happen next. Yeah. Without giving anything away yeah. what do you think the film says about mental conditions mm. and extreme stress mm. well i mean it is difficult it's a it's a hard film to talk about because I, I it's one of those films where you know the less you know about it the better i think which is you know the reaction we got when it when it played at the sydney film festival you know people kind of are really open to you know, just taking a punt on something, and the, and they did, and and we got some incredibly strong reactions. Um, people loved it at the, at the festival. Um, what does it say about the mental condition? Um, I don't really know. I mean, I think it's, I think it's, you know, it talks about it talks about. It's it's, it's a difficult thing to talk about without giving it away. Sure. Unless someone's seen the film. Yeah. Um, obviously. You know, there's a it's a lot to do with the mother child relationship, um, and that and the strength of that bond, um, and it's a lot to do with um, with fear, I suppose, and and um, and with self deception. Yeah, I was going to suggest self deception, mm. the uh, the power of denial. Yeah. As a coping mechanism. Yeah. And also the power of memory, I guess, mm. as well. Mm. These are factors that play very strongly into 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 what is, you know, a, a great third act in the mm. film. Mm. Yeah, I mean I was I there is, you know, there's a few things that happen, plot points in there that I simply didn't see coming mm. when I read it. And and you really did want to kind of flip back and, and start reading again from page one when I read the script and, and that's a testament to, to, I think Chris's writing, Christopher Horton is the writer director. Um, one of the things I loved about this film was that I, I'm a big fan of small budget kind of cinema because I think that, you know, people, when they, when they have these kind of, you know, you have X amount of money, you know, so you have to write a story that fits, you know, that you can do with you know, few characters, few locations. And he did such a brilliant job of working within those restrictions and, uh, and that's something I find really exciting. That's why I like the, you know, the dogma films or, mm. or a lot of the American kind of, um, I think they call it mumblecore cinema, yeah. like Joe Swanberg and, and people like that and the Duplass brothers. Um, and I think that, um, you know, this was really exciting to see this emerging out of this, I think it was this program film lab in, in South Australia. And I, I think, you know, that's where some great filmmakers come from, that kind of territory. Independent filmmakers are always operating on a shoestring mm. and they're always pulling favours, asking for deferments and so forth. Mm. As an actor, what kind of things are asked of you uh, to participate in a film like this? Uh, well, you know, this, you're not doing it for money. <laughs> um, I had a very restricted kind of time to, I mean, I did about two weeks work on all up on, on the film because mm -hmm. I was just coming straight off rake as well and they they kind of clashed and I had something straight after that as well. 
So you're kind of shoehorning everything into this, you know, small amount of time. Mm. It's just, you know, every, a lot of the kind of the fluff is stripped away. Yeah. <laughs> really. Uh, not much is asked because, you know, I love doing it. You know, I love well, I love the job. And uh, When you make a decision to make a film like this, but what's the balance between doing a job because it's artistically fulfilling and doing something because it's going to help pay the next gas bill? Well, you just have to factor in where the job's coming from, you know, who the people are involved, you know, you know, do, you know, this was something that's come through a particular program and you know that they've got money from funding, from government funding. So there's money there and they've got a proper budget. So, you know, you know that you can, that's going to kind of measure up. I've done jobs in the past because, you know, they've paid well and I've, pretty much every time regretted doing it. So <laughs> it's not really a factor. Can I dare you, know? you to name just one project? No. Okay. <laughs> Can't blame me These for trying These ones you kind of like, the CV's ain't going, yeah, take that <laughs> off. But, well, you know, okay. I mean, it's, it's it's not a bad thing. But, I mean, look, one of my all-time favorite films that I ever worked on, you know, I earned not much at all for, which was Love and Other Catastrophes. And, and that was a film that we did in... They shot in 17 days, and I think they had about $20,000 to play with. And these are the days of film where you couldn't cut things on your laptop. And um, and that was uh, an amazing experience, you know, mm. and that traveled the world, you know. So you've got to balance up mm. the artistic with it. But you don't become an actor for the money. I mean, if you do, you're crazy. <laughs> now, Matt, this is a, touches a really beautifully made, well-directed, I think, in many cases, superbly acted film, mm. rich in nuance and subtlety with, I think, a terrific third act. If this was an American film, this would be out on maybe 140, 150 screens, mm -hmm. would make probably a few million dollars, would get some really good reviews. It's playing on a handful of screens. Mm -hmm. And I'm scared that the film's going to get lost mm -hmm. in the swamp of the film market. It's opening a week after Mad Max. Mm -hmm. Are you concerned that the film is not getting the marketing support that it deserves? Yeah. Well, look, what we've seen, and, and you'd know this, and this is a, just a general observation, not in particular just, just to, to touch, but what we've seen in the last 10, 20 years is kind of, um, you know, that, that middle market of filmmaking, you know, the low-end low end indie, indie kind of market of filmmaking is kind of, Hollywood has just kind of taken it to a, such a you know, blockbuster level now where they, they spend, you know, $100 million promoting a film and getting it out there. And even the art house cinemas now play mainstream Hollywood films. So those places that were traditionally set aside for, for small, you know, independent cinema are kind of disappeared. Um, there's just uh, so many films out there as well that you're competing against. Um, it's it's really, really hard for mm. filmmakers to kind of even be heard. It, it was meant to be a digital revolution where now you didn't need all this stuff and you could tell, you know, just put it on Facebook, you know, or you know, tell everyone your film's out there. But it's actually, there's so much more noise that it's just so much more difficult to, to get it out there. So, yeah, I do, I am concerned about that. But what can you do? I'm, I'm not an expert on yeah. <laughs> the distribution level, but... But, uh, you know, you hope with a, with a release like this, which is like a traditional platform release, um, word of mouth, does that still count? I hope it mm. does. You know? Matt, you've been around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you're on TV in Country Practice and then you hit Big and Muriel's Wedding and then Kiss or Kill and so on. Mm. Would it be fair to describe you as a journeyman actor? Sure. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'd be happy to wear yeah. that label. Yeah. <laughs> How's the journey going? The journey's good. You know, it treats me well, you know. Um, I'm very lucky to do what I do, you know, and to keep doing it. Um, you know, it's kind of each year something always pops up. There's always work. So, uh, you know, it's a great job. I think anyone anyone can make a living out of doing what they love doing is, is, is incredibly lucky. Can you give us a comparison of your observations of the state of the Australian film industry comparing, you know, the kiss or kill days when that film won best director and at best and best uh, film mm -hmm. at the AFIs to now. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about mid nineties to the mid 
2010s. Yeah. What's the main <clears throat> observation you'd, you'd make in terms of difference? The differences? Well, look, it's always been difficult. It's always hard to make films. I think it's more difficult now than what it was then for the simple, you know, for the, for the reasons I said before, it's the international scene, you know, the whole kind of market for mid-level, low, low-end budget films has kind of um, dropped away a lot, you know. So that was, whereas we could kind of compete with American and international films, you know, we could make similar kind of films for much lower budgets. It's it's not the case anymore. You know, it's a lot harder for people to finance films. Do you think the Australian film industry is more genre-oriented and more audience-aware now than it was, say, back in the in the late 90s, early 2000s? There know. seems to be a turnaround, but what do you think? I think I think that there are a lot of young filmmakers who, who you know, love genre films and, and, you know, are getting a chance to make them. Um, I don't know if that necessarily means that they're audience-orientated. You know, I mean, nobody, it, it is true that nobody knows anything, you know, like when I got a script, you know, that was about, a, you know, this shy girl who loved ABBA, I never for a second thought, I, mean, I just thought, well, you know, I don't know what this is about, you know, <laughs> you know, I didn't really know that there was a market for it. And mm. I don't think anyone really did, mm. you know, or, um, or, you know, three drag queens across the desert. It, you, nobody knows what, what works and what doesn't. They just keep trying. That's all we can do, I think, in this industry. Muriel's wedding turned 20 last year. I know, I know. Talk about the marker of getting old. Yeah. You celebrated the anniversary. What What did you do? How did you feel about <laughs> being a, a supporting actor in what has turned into a classic Australian film? I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy to be a part of that film. Um, um, yeah, it's, it is strange. It is a strange thing. It seems like yesterday. But, um, you know, I think it's, I think it stand up. It still stands up. It stands, you know, it stood the test of time. Um, I think it's a, it's a, a lot darker film. I watched it again recently and it's a lot darker from what I remember, you know, but there was, um, it was a good kind of observation of, uh, Australian life, you know, snapshot shot of Australia in the nineties. It's about a woman who was obsessed with the status yeah. of saying that she's married completely Mm. Uh, disregarding any substance mm. to the concept, it does have a dark undertone to it. Mm. Mm. Now, what are you up to at the moment? You're rehearsing? Yeah, we're just in the thick of rehearsals for uh, North by Northwest with How's the Melbourne going? Theatre Company. It's good. Yeah, it's good. It's great. <laughs> how how uh, how are you going to do it? It's one of <clears throat> Hitchcock's most cinematic films. Yeah. How do you do that on stage? Well, it's a cinematic play. <laughs> There's a, yeah, I, I don't want to give away no. too much, but, you know, there was a series of kind of um, in-depth workshops carried out last year, which I wasn't a part of. So it's kind of been a big reveal for me this week. I was like, oh, wow, that's what we're doing. But it involves, you know, there is a screen and there is kind of a lot of model work happening on stage. And, um, yeah, it's, it's ambitious. <laughs> it's ambitious. Not only that, but arguably family plot might be the second best plot that Hitchcock mm. ever had. North by Northwest, I reckon, is by far the best, most intricately structured plot. Mm. What's it like, even in rehearsal, getting all that exposition out? Well, I don't stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> from the second I get on stage to you know to the end of the to the end of the play um uh, it's a lot of fun i mean i think it it is uh, there is a lot of plot but it's also classic um hitchcock macguffin you know it's not really about this plot so much it, uh, that it's about you know this kind of romance between the two you know for, between Roger Thornhill and and Eve and um you know it's it's just great fun it's great fun the dialogue is just wonderful. 